Good morning. This is Open Mics with Dr. Stites. Clearly, Dr. Stites is off today because I'm not him. I'm Alexis Del Cid filling in for Dr. Stites this week. And we have a really fascinating topic for you today. If you think of chemotherapy, the chances are you picture an IV drip. And generally speaking, that's what happens. But sometimes chemotherapy and other cancer treatments can be put into a pill form. Oral chemo and other oral anti-cancer treatments have their pros and cons. And today we're gonna to hear about those trade-offs from two cancer survivors who use those meds. And we'll also meet the pharmacist who specializes in these oral options and a nurse who educates both patients and colleagues. She's the best in the business. So joining us today is Dr. Marshall Johnson, a pharmacist and the clinical coordinator of oral chemotherapy and specialty pharmacy at the University of Kansas Cancer Center. Good morning to you. Good morning. And joining us by phone is Malin Jones. She is a registered nurse and the unit educator at the Westwood Clinic location of the KU Cancer Center. Malin, thank you so much for being here. And we're also joined by two cancer survivors. Both Kyle Mead and Lindsay Mills are taking oral anti-cancer drugs. So Lindsay, I wanna start with you. you. You say you had skin cancer back in 2014, melanoma. How did you initially get that treated? Yeah, so in 2014, um, it started as a mole that was discovered on my shoulder. And I was just went to a dermatologist and they're like, oh, that looks really bad. We need to take that off. Um, and yeah, when the biopsy came back, it was a large enough melanoma that had to um, have wide incision surgery um, on it to, to take it off. So that was kind of like my initial treatment was just a surgery. Um, and then at that time, I did have several lymph nodes removed as well. Um, to make sure that it hadn't spread to those. And thankfully, I got the news that it had come back clear. So that was kind of my initial treatment. And then you had a follow-up. Every cancer survivor has follow-ups. Thank goodness you had that follow-up. How did you learn then at, that how yeah. much it had spread? Yeah, so um, follow-ups, I got, I got assigned uh, an oncologist at the KU Cancer Center, which was awesome. And at first, I didn't really understand why, you know, they had gotten all the cancer out and didn't really understand the gravity of melanoma at the time. Um, and I was getting regular CT scans. So had those CT scans done about every six months. Um, and then in 2017, um, I started having some spots show up in my lungs. Um, they weren't really sure what they were at first, but then again, routine checks and scans and follow-ups, um, those spots grew bigger and bigger, eventually led to a biopsy, and those came back as, in fact, melanoma. So I ended up with three um, tumors in my lungs, uh, which then, of course, made it stage four melanoma. How did you wind up taking the oral therapy? And did you know that that was even an option when you first started on this journey? I had no idea. I literally had no idea. Um, when I found out it was stage four, you know, you immediately think traditional chemo, you know, I'm going to lose my hair. I'm going to be on death's door. You know, how am I going to get through this? I was um, just barely 30 at the time and I have two small kids. So it was totally terrifying. Um, and my doctor that I have at the cancer center said, Hey, you know, because of this mutation you have in your gene, you actually qualify for a clinical trial. And so, um, you know, he, he asked me, you know, what do you think about trying this oral immunotherapy as our first run of, of attack on this? And I was like, sure, why not? Let's try it. You know? Um, yeah. So that's how I ended up on the oral therapy. I want to bring in Kyle now, Kyle Mead, also a cancer survivor, and your story has similarities to Lindsay's. You also had melanoma. This was back in 2001, so that's quite a while ago. How did you find out you had melanoma? And then tell us your journey into the oral cancer treatments. Uh, similar to Lindsay, I had um, a skin cancer, like a mole on my back, and um, I was actually in a wave pool, and my back just started bleeding. And um, we were on vacation, so we came back, uh, saw the doctor, and he did the biopsy. And a week later, they said it's uh, Clark's level three back then in 01. Um, 
and things were a lot different back then. Um, they did they did like the uh, procedure. They took about a football panel out of my back, and then again excised all the lymph nodes that drain from that area. And um, <clears throat> I got tested for ten years after that. Um, essentially, I got tested until insurance stopped paying for it about a decade later, and then um, thought I was fine. Uh, then in 2018, I developed a consistent, just kind of a soft cough. And I, I coughed for probably too long, about six weeks. And it was getting bad enough to where I was starting to get short of breath, walking up steps and things. And um, I, I had like, it felt like what I had was a heart attack one day. I went into uh, the hospital and they... Um, they tested me for everything, but we didn't do any scans. Um, and they knew my previous history, but at that time we didn't do any scans. And I did a, some tests for on the treadmill and that, and I passed all those. So they sent me on my way, went back to work, about six more weeks of the cough. And um, I finally just, uh, there was a night where I, 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 everything was kind of shutting down. <clears throat> so I went to KU which I didn't go to the first time. Uh, I went to KU, and within about five hours, they, they told me that I have a tumor on my heart, um, wow. which is kind of right right across from where my incision was on my back. Um, but it was large enough to where they were pretty sure it was cancer. So we did a uh, – I was in the hospital at KU for about 15 days, and we did a biopsy there. And, and confirmed um, that it was melanoma, and that was pretty rare uh, on the on the heart. Um, so at that time, um, they weren't sure. Uh, I didn't do on the previously in 01 too. I didn't do any chemo or anything like that. It was just it was just the, the surgery. Um, so I did it. I did start on Keytruda, um, mm -hmm. which was the drip. Uh, I took that for, I took it for three, three treatments, and on the third treatment, <clears throat> I, it develop, I developed uh, medically induced diabetes, and um, and then uh, at each treatment later, I, I I got pneumonia each time, so I had wow. pneumonia like, yeah, I had pneumonia like three times, and <clears throat> they decided to try the, try the uh, oral targeted therapy methods. And I went through some trials on different different ones um, and Braftovi and Mectovi are, ended up being the ones that, um, that worked without too many side effects. So how many pills, do you still take these pills and how many pills do you take a day, Kyle? And how often do you take them? For cancer, I take 12 pills um, three Mectovi in the morning with with a six uh, six Braftovi, and then three more Mectovi at night when I go to bed. Um, so you take twelve pills a day, 12, and then 12, Lindsay, how many for the cancer? Right. <clears throat> Lindsay, what about you? Yeah, so I take five pills a day, and my drugs are a little bit different. I take uh, dibrafenib and trametinib, and those are my um, targeted therapy drugs that I have. They all end in nib. <laughs> it's really funny. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I take like three in the morning and, and two at night, So, and I'm still on them. Yeah, I've been on them for about six years. Do you have side effects from them? Um, very minimal, honestly, and I think over time I've just kind of learned how to uh, adjust. Um, sometimes I get headaches. Um, the most common side effects for these drugs are really high fevers. Um, that's happened to me a couple times. Um, but honestly, um, yeah, fatigue is, is another one that sometimes I struggle with, but I've kind of just learned to take care of my body a different way so that these things don't mm -hmm. happen. Um, but it really hasn't stopped me from living a completely normal life. I go on vacation, I just take the drugs with me in a little ice pack, you know, and um, yeah, I, I'm able to work full time and um, it's been really um, amazing to, to be able to do this. Kyle, has your experience been the same as far as side effects go? Um, no, I, I, had, I had the fevers for like the first six months um, mm -hmm. pretty, pretty consistently. Um, 
but at that time we were kind of going through the different drugs to try and figure out what worked with with minimal uh you know minimal effects um i did have a on the on the cancer walk this is kind of ironical but i i uh, had a pulmonary embolism when we did the cancer walk so <clears throat> Uh, I got on blood thinners for a while. I've, I've kind of had all of the uh, side effects that you can have. Uh, right now, really, they're less worried about the cancer than they are the diabetic issue. So um, that's kind of what I'm trying to control. The diabetes? Yeah. yeah that, I want to bring to... Dr. Johnson. <clears throat> sure. Sorry, we have a delay, so we keep stepping oh, on each other. Fine. Um, Dr. Johnson, will Kyle and Lindsay need to take these pills forever? Yeah, so it, it really is one of those scenarios that um, risks versus benefits is how this works, right? And as long as they're able to tolerate, at least for, you know, the, the type of cancer that they survived and they battled, um, this is something that they will take in basically perpetuity or, or as long as they can handle the side effects. And then when it comes to lingo, some people say oral chemo pills, but the treatments aren't limited to just chemotherapy, right? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, you know, it's you kind of hear it all across um, all across the nation. People will say oral chemo, but you could think of it like oral oncolytic as well. But we also use things that are um, hormonal agents or uh, you know immuno agents. So I like to say oral anti cancer is usually the best way to go mm -hmm. for these. Well, that's what people can understand, anti-cancer. Everybody can get on board yeah. with that and understand what it is. Dr. Johnson, um, how new are these? Actually, they've been around since 1960. Um, wow. So the oldest agent, fun fact, is actually methotrexate, which is something we use in our world, but also used in a lot of different other disease states outside of cancer. Um, and it's it's funny, the history of these, if you look at how oral agents have been developed compared to your drip agents, your infusion agents, we're starting to see a switch in how many of the new ones are focused around orals as opposed to infusions. Neither are going anywhere, but we're seeing a large increase in the orals. So from 2000 till now, more than half of the agents that are currently on the market have actually been developed within the last 20 years. So we're over 160 agents total now. Oh, that's interesting. And Melon, you're a nurse coordinator as well as a unit educator. So you're in charge of training all the other nurses on how to refill these prescriptions. Melon joins us by phone, but we have video. Or, I'm sorry, Melin joins us by phone, but we have some video of Melin doing some training. It's a lot of computer work inside the charting system. So is the workflow for oral cancer drugs much different than other prescriptions? It is. It is very different. Um, you know, most of the time when we prescribe a medication, it goes directly to the, the pharmacy. But with our oral anti-cancer drugs, we have our wonderful clinical pharmacist team at the cancer center, and all of our prescriptions go to them first. And they do a series of checks through the patient's chart, go over their history to make sure that this is the correct medication for the correct patient, correct dosing, everything um, so we can guarantee that our patients are getting the right therapy prescribed to them. Melin, do you have to be extra careful with these pills, the chemo pills or anti-cancer pills as far as touching them like you would touch any other medications? Yeah, and so whenever we prescribe these medications to our patients, we do try to educate them that if the patient is the one handling the medication, they can obviously touch the pills, but we want to make sure that they wash their hands thoroughly after those pills are administered. And then if maybe our patients are too th sick and they need help with medication management and someone else is administering those pills, we try to educate them to be even more um, stringent with how they handle these medications. Make sure they're out of reach mm -hmm. of children and pets. Um, make sure that they are stored properly. Some are stored in the refrigerator versus at room temperature. And also having them wash their hands after they touch these medications. And then with chemo infusions, patients would always come in on a regular basis, a routine basis. They've got that scheduled. And the care team would see that patient, check in on how they're doing. So. Dr. Johnson, when patients go home with these oral anti-cancer options, does that mean that they don't see their doctor as often? Yeah, uh, that's it's kind of a it's a trade-off, right? Um, 
they don't come in as frequently for appointments. However, they do have regularly scheduled appointments. Uh, but the benefit right. of the oral agents is that, the, you know, we, we give the patient, uh, you know, Lindsay and Kyle, for example, the power to manage their own treatment, which I think um, for some people is really encouraging and uplifting in that process. Um, and it allows us or allows that patient to have a lot more freedom, I think, in terms of their schedule from day to day. Uh, so, you know, but there are some drawbacks. Everything that has an upside usually has the other side of that as well, right? And sometimes usually we're having trouble with just getting the medication to the patient because of insurance delays has always been kind of the biggest problem. And I see Lindsay nodding her head there a little bit. So probably experienced that once or twice. Well, that's frustrating if there's an insurance problem holding up your <clears throat> anti-cancer treatment. What, what happened to you, Lindsay? I think that uh, it may, may have just been because I was a part of a clinical trial, but there was definitely okay. like a four month delay um, when I first started going back and forth between the insurance company and uh, my doctor and then basically proving that this was the right therapy and this is what um, was best for me. Um, really, really expensive. Um, but yeah, super fortunate that um, I've been able to stay on it as long as I have and, and they're still paying for it. So. <laughs> well, thank God for that. Milan, I want to ask you, um, Dr. Johnson was talking about how it comes down to trust and you have to know that that patient's going to take, be able to do that and stick to that schedule. Is there ever an instance where you realize a patient isn't going to be good at self-discipline and taking those pills where you can advise them to do something else, like they have to come in for the drip? Yeah, we we take a lot of those factors into consideration when our doctors prescribe these medications to the patients. We want to look at their living arrangements. We want to look at do they have good family support and friend support to help them along this journey, <clears throat> excuse me, if they would have side effects from the medication. Um, we also look at um, you know, do they have access to insurance? Do they have access to the money um, to pay for medications that might help with side effects? And so there is a plethora of considerations that we take in when prescribing medications to our patients, especially when they're taking those medications at home. A lot of our patients think, oh, it's a pill, you know, just like their blood pressure mm -hmm. medication. and. Although they are a pill, they are still chemotherapy, targeted therapy, immunotherapy, and so they do come with side effects. And we want to stress that to our patients to make sure that they understand that, you know, if you miss a dose with your blood pressure medication, your blood pressure might be high for a day, but if you miss a dose of these medications, the side effects or the outcome might not be as good. So um, we take a lot of these things into consideration when prescribing these medications. Dr. Johnson, we know these drugs have a certain level of toxicity. Uh, most of these kinds of powerful drugs do, but you also have a financial, uh, a phrase to do with finance. It's called financial toxicity. What is financial toxicity and how can you help your patients with that? Yeah. Um... I think this is one of the most overlooked toxicities that most people uh, aren't even aware of, right, until you're in the scenario where you have to pay for these. And Malin briefly mentioned that these are pretty pricey medications. So, uh, you know, average cash price, if you were to just go to the specialty pharmacy to get these, you're looking at between fourteen dollars to $15,000 per cycle. So, you know, God bless insurance in that scenario. Um, but luckily, what we have uh, within our own health system is our own internal specialty pharmacy. So for anybody who's newly prescribed any kind of oral anti-cancer, that first script will always go to our specialty pharmacy first. And what they're doing is uh, what they call a benefits investigation. So they're looking, submitting to the insurance that this is what the patient has. Um, and then we're getting back a copay, depending on what the insurance will, will not cover. And then from there, we usually, our goal is usually a zero dollar copay. It's not always feasible for our patients, but there are things out there such as copay assistance programs from manufacturers that help lower the cost of the medication. There's uh, charitable um, foundations out there that offer money through grants when those are available. And then kind of as a last ditch effort, we always use what they call a medication assistance or patient assistance program, which is uh, patients who are eligible for this can get free drug through the manufacturer if they meet the criteria for that. So there, there are ways to help patients get what they need to survive. Yes, very much so. We're already getting 
questions on our chat line and we're here to answer <laughs> all of them. So be sure to send them to us using the links on your screen. We're everywhere, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, email the Medical News Network. We'll be asking your questions in just a bit. But first we wanna check in with our COVID count, Dr. Dana Hawkinson, Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control here at the health system. Did you Hi. have a nice holiday? Yeah, it was nice, it was, it was nice out. I think it's good we got some rain overnight too. Did so. you get any sleep? I did get sleep. Oh, yeah. you slept through the fireworks. Then. Yeah, it's good. There's one night a year that I can I can listen to fireworks. It's it's pretty, it's pretty neat when you if you can drive around the city too and just right. see them going off all over the place. So. How are our numbers looking? Uh, numbers are really good uh, right now. Eight total, but only four active. Luckily, no severe illness. None in the ICU and none on the ventilator. So. We're getting some new research about long COVID, and there's constant research into long COVID. Yeah. In fact, you um, sent us a new study in the British Medical Journal. Mm -hmm. It's looking at people who were not vaccinated, got COVID, and yeah. one in five of those people who were not vaccinated, caught COVID, are reporting long COVID mm -hmm. symptoms two years after the original infection. What yeah. are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think we need to remember too, you know, there is some good information and data to support the fact that vaccination does help reduce your risk. This study period, however, was before vaccination was available. And so that's why we are able to say that about the unvaccinated people. This took place from okay. August 2020 to about February 2021. So really there wasn't widespread vaccine use or any at that time period that the study participants were initially enrolled. And what they have found is that 18% of those people at two years still had some symptoms. And actually 17% of those people at two years really never regained their uh, baseline health status prior to that infection. So I think this is just more information continuing to support the fact that uh, we know long COVID can affect people's daily lives. It does improve as time goes on, but there is still a significant proportion of people that can be affected by uh, some persistent symptoms or just changes after they've had COVID-19. So this, this study found one in five who mm -hmm. were not vaccinated and got it have long COVID. Mm -hmm. Have they studied how many people who are vaccinated that have long COVID two years out? You know, uh, that I'm not specifically aware of, but we again, we do know that there are studies looking at vaccinated versus unvaccinated in those people that do develop long COVID. And we know that vaccination uh, on the different studies uh, has reduced the risk of long COVID anywhere from 15 to, to 35%. So okay. um, that is important to note as well. Now, unfortunately, those studies were done at a time period then is different than this time period. Now we are um, you know, two and a half years into vaccines being available, uh, primary series, booster series, but also those people that have been infected and reinfected uh, and have immunity. So teasing out some of these specific questions may be a little bit more difficult as time goes on. Interesting. Yeah. I want to ask if we have any reporter questions today. Anyone on the line? We have plenty of our viewer questions from our community. Jean has a question. This is for Kyle. Um, you mentioned you had medically induced diabetes and Jean would like to know if you treat it the same way you would treat non-medically induced diabetes. Um, the only thing I can reference there is that I, I'm on a, uh, a like a higher dosage um, insulin than a normal type two diabetic. Um, and it was like on the third round of the uh, Keytruda that I developed the diabetes and literally in their in their side effect warnings, it, it was like the third, they said this can happen after the third treatment and, and it just did. But uh, um, I'm, I'm on insulin, just kind of like a normal person. I, I have a, I have a pump, um, okay. but uh, it's, it's kind of, I take steroids too for some of the problems, and um, it's a little bit of a roller coaster. Terry has a question for Kyle and Lindsay. Terry wants to know if either of you have ever missed a dose. I'll start with you, Lindsay. Nope. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, actually, I have. Um, there was a, a time when I, I actually took a trip to Chicago and um, I forgot my meds and yeah, it oh, was, stressful. it was a little, 
It was very stressful. Um, I missed one day, and my my family were, was able to get a hold of them, and they actually overnighted them to me via FedEx. <laughs> so uh -huh. that I would have them in Chicago because I was there for an extended period of time. Um, but I mean, I, I only have missed one day, which is, is really um, pretty incredible over this time that I've been on them. But yeah, it didn't really affect anything with that. Are you supposed to d take more, like double up, or is this a case where you miss a dose and you just keep going and continue with your next <clears throat> regular dose? Yeah, you, you pretty much just, depending on which one I'm like, there's one of the drugs I can take within 24 hours, um, okay. that's the trametinib. You just take it once a day and it can be within the 24 hours. The other drug, there has to be, there's a time frame in between each that, that I have to follow. So with that one, I basically just skipped and then started back up with the next one. And Kyle, what about you, Kyle? Have you ever missed a dose? Yeah, yeah, I've, I've missed a dose probably more times than I should. Um, I take three um, of the Mectovi at night and you know, fatigue's one of the one of the issues sometimes, and sometimes I just fall asleep. Um, I've, I've probably, I mean, it's, it's it's under nine, but I've been on it for you know five years going on now. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's it sounds like a lot, but it, <laughs> I've never had any problems with it. Um, I've like a, I've got like a six hour window, so when I fall asleep, I, I essentially I just miss a dose, and it's never been okay. the Braftovi; it's been the Mectovi. Dr. Johnson, we have a question from Joan who wants to know if these pills are always a tablet or could it be a liquid gel tab? Yeah, uh, they come um, in all shapes and sizes, right? So they will come in form of tablets. So you're, you know, those hard coated things that you'll feel. Um, they'll come as capsules. Um, some of these things actually come as uh, oral liquids as well, depending, right? Um, and I think one of the unique things is not all of these agents, but um, a lot of these agents, we can actually take that capsule or tablet and make it a liquid as well for those patients that are having trouble swallowing, or if say they have um, medical devices or tubes that they need to utilize instead of taking things by mouth. This is such an interesting discussion and so informative. I'm very grateful that you all could join us, especially after the 4th of July holiday. So I, I wanna hear your final thoughts before we all head out. And Kyle, I'll start with you. Well, I think my big takeaway in paying it forward would be if you've got anything, um, a cough, anything that's outside your the normal way you feel, um, if it's consistent, uh, go get it checked. Um, I, I probably waited too long um, on the second time I've got it, and uh, uh, it's just a, it's just so easy to do. Um, but just go get checked. And then my other takeaway would be, I think some of my problems, if if you're super healthy, um, I, I think you're probably going to be in, in better in the long long run if you're just keep yourself physically fit and everything. And Lindsay, what would you like our viewers to know? I think for me, um, yeah, obviously I agree with Kyle. You know, early detection is huge with any kind of cancer, especially with melanoma. Um, I, I think the biggest thing is just that there's hope. Like, there's so much hope. Um, there's so many advancements in technology. And um, if you do get that super scary news of cancer, um, your life's not over and you can continue to have a life, you can continue to um, have a family, work, go after your dreams, all those things, um, like it's possible. It's not, a, it's not a death sentence as it once was, so yeah. Hope is such a good word, such a key word to use. Dr. Johnson? Oh, there's so much I wanna say, but in this, uh, in this brief time, right? Um, I, think it's, I think it's important for everybody to know that your care, there's so much going on behind the scenes with you know, your physicians, your APPs, your pharmacists, your, your, uh, your clinical nurse coordinators, that everybody really is collaborating together to make sure that um, you're receiving the best possible care and the best possible treatment you can, you can get. Right. So from all things, from the start of diagnosis through all the way through just follow up or routine visits that you're going to have touch points with all these individuals who care deeply about you and are trying to do everything they can to make sure that that medicine gets into your hand in the safest and most affordable way possible.
And Malin, you play a key role in that in making sure people know and they're educated on both ends of this journey. What would you like our viewers to know? Yeah, I think Marshall hit it on the, the head there. Um, we have a wonderful team here at the KU Cancer Center, and we care deeply about our patients. And we fight every day with insurance companies, and we are such a great team where we work together to get the patients what they need. Um, and to the people that are on these medications, like Lindsay said, Keep on hoping because there are new advancements in cancer research every single day, and we are not going to stop fighting to get our patients the best treatment and the best care that we can. And if you are on these therapies and you have questions or you might have something that comes up that just doesn't seem right, call your care teams. We are here for you, and we can answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, and thank you to our patients, Kyle and Lindsay, for joining us, and our audience, thank you for joining the conversation. We will see you back here on Friday. Coming up Friday on the Morning Medical Update. When cancer pills aren't enough to stop pain, some patients turn to a spinal cord implant. I'm Jessica Lovell. On the next Morning Medical Update, we meet one of the few surgeons in the country performing this procedure and hear how it finally brought relief for one patient, Friday at 8 a.m. Subscribe to our Morning Medical Update and Open Mics with Dr. Stites podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.